Let me get this out of the way up front. I like beer bad. It's a candy episode for me, even if it is stupid, silly, totally lacking in subtlety, and completely puritanical. Sure, there isn't any depth to the theme here. It's right there in the title. But come on now, how can you not love... Foamy. Foamy indeed, Buffy. Foamy indeed. Buffy has adopted a rather Matrix-like attire and new soundtrack. She is kicking ass and not bothering with names in the cemetery, and she realizes who this vamp's victim is. I love her fantasy here. It's like a video game fever dream. They even add some 80 sound effects to the mix. <laughs> Parker walks over in his bright red jacket. The music swells. Turns out it was all a daydream. Miss Walsh is leading a class on Freudian psychology and the basic hierarchy of needs. The id doesn't learn. It doesn't grow up. Freudian psychology informed much of season two, though I did a pretty poor job of covering it. And it rears its head again here. Freud divided our personalities into three parts, the id, the ego, and the superego. The id, as Walsh says, is our animal side, our basest instincts. Sex, food, shelter. The ego is the rational part of our minds that process information about the world, and the superego, for lack of a better term, represents our better selves. It's what reminds us of our goals and the expectations laid upon us by society. There's an interesting symbolic interpretation of the Scoobies, which has Xander as Buffy's id, all desires and impulses, Willow as Buffy's ego, helping her sort and process the world around her, and Giles as Buffy's superego, calling her to adulthood and her better self. To this point, most of the monsters on the show are constructed manifestations of the id. Vampires have been very well covered as selfishly driven beings, even instances where they might appear to be acting selflessly, say Spike letting the vampire wannabes go to save Drusilla, is actually selfishness through the template model of vampirism. You also have werewolves, another id monster, drawn to spots where kids are making out, a mindless beast driven to feed and possibly reproduce, and then finally we have Parker, an id monster himself, using his powers of persuasion to satisfy satisfy his most basest of instincts. In reaction to Walsh's lesson, Buffy revises her vision of the apologetic Parker, now hairlessly bare-chested holding flowers and a pint of ice cream. The next day, Xander has now gotten a job as the bartender in the campus bar. Buffy is still indulging in some Parker fantasies, and we can see Willow's best friend Patience starting to wear thin. Buffy goes to the campus bar to visit Xander at his new job and accidentally runs into Riley. Oh, of course, Riley is drinking ice water at the bar. I'm surprised it isn't a glass of warm milk. On her way to try and leave the bar, Buffy is complimented by a foursome of relatively harmless upperclassmen who offer her a beer. At the bronze, Oz and Willow are having a drink, and Oz feels something odd. On stage comes Veruca. Veruca seems to be staring into Oz's soul, and something is going on he doesn't realize. We could go back to your place. I could make you soup. But Willow does. The next day, Buffy seems to have a more simplified perspective on things. TV is a good thing. Bright colors. Willow misinterprets Buffy's explanation of the night before as her having had group sex with four guys. Then she drags Buffy to class, where Buffy steals a sandwich from another student, the id, at work. Turns out the bartender, Xander's boss, is brewing a cursed variety of beer that introduces evolutionary regression in anyone who drinks it. As trouble starts to brew, see what I did there, Willow finds Parker in the bar and decides to give him her two cents, seemingly motivated in part by her current distance with Oz. As they talk, the college smarties Buffy was hanging out with go full Cro-Magnon. They try and attack Xander, and he manages to scare them off with fire. Meanwhile, Parker is still making his case with Willow about how he's never really connected with anyone. And yet, he's enjoyed talking with her tonight, this night of nights. Just how gullible do you think I am? You see, this is one of the reasons I love this episode. Maybe it's just me, but this moment caught me genuinely by surprise. Because Willow is so often honest and forthright, I read her as falling for Parker's shtick, when in reality, she was manipulating him. I was reminded of season one when she got Hyena Xander to reveal himself. Now I know. Willow is often brilliant, but I love when she is revealed as crafty. The cavemen break in and accidentally start a fire. Cave Slayer Buffy, I was reminded of a character we won't meet until the last episode of this season, saves the day. And Parker finally gives Buffy the respect she's been desiring the whole time. And 
that's pretty much it. Alcohol strips us of our superegos, turning us into id monsters. Nothing but basic instincts and behavior. More simply, beer bad, bad, bad beer. Of course, the least believable part of this episode is that anyone would mistake this behavior for drunkenness. And if beer bad feels like an overly simplistic piece of silly puritanical government propaganda, well, that's because it is. In the early 2000s, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy made a deal with the networks that they would waive the rights to their advertising spots, provided the networks incorporated anti-drug and anti-alcohol messages into their shows. The WB agreed, and beer bad is one of the results of the deal. The funding was rejected for the episode because drugs were an issue, but it was, according to them, otherworldly nonsense, very abstract and not like real-life kids taking drugs. Viewers wouldn't make the link with the White House's message, if only the government had been more patient. I don't think the episode was necessarily written expressly to capitalize on the deal, rather that the deal lined up well with the timing of the show. American college binge drinking is a thing. In a BBC interview, Douglas Petrie said, well, very young people get unlimited access to alcohol and become horrible. We we all do it, or most of us do it, and live to regret it, and we wanted to explore that. The PSA episode isn't totally unself-aware, of course. I can't believe you served Buffy that beer. I didn't know it was evil. You knew it was beer. Well, excuse me, mister, I spent the 60s in an electric Kool-Aid funky Satan groove. It was the early 70s, and you should know better. But honestly, there's still a lot to enjoy here. Cave Slayer is downright adorable, and I love a number of the silly jokes, like Xander scaring the cavemen off with fire. The foreign language names for beer bad are also entertaining. The French title translates to devil's beverage, and the German, the beer of evil thinking. I have noticed a small minority of commenters who think that Parker doesn't get a fair shake in these episodes, and is subjected to a disproportionate level of hate, especially when you compare him to someone like Spike. I'll find her, wherever she is, tie her up, torture her, till she likes me again. I'm simplifying the argument here, but the main points are, first, that Parker did not tell Buffy a lie, second, that an interest in casual sex doesn't make a person unethical, and finally, that what Parker said to Willow in the bar was true. Hooking up is about fire and passion, and asking someone to sign a contract saying they know it isn't going to go anywhere kills the fire. All of these things are true. They're also missing the point. Parker is not a supervillain. He's a con man, and con men are in some ways more vicious as they convince their targets to voluntarily act against their own self-interest, which can often end up in the victim wrongly blaming themselves. Parker was not a sensitive guy who liked to hook up. He was a predator, using his veneer of sensitivity as bait to the bed. Motivation matters. Take, for instance, the story about his father. My father died last year. What made it so sad was that there was a lot of stuff he didn't get to finish. It made me think about living for now. This is a pretty intimate detail from a normal person's life, and the telling of it reveals the fundamental wrong at play here. Buffy is misinterpreting his share as a moment of vulnerability and intimacy. And the fact that Parker is seen later telling the same story to a different woman shows that he knows the way this story will be misinterpreted, and capitalizes on that misinterpretation deliberately. That is dishonest. He may never tell a lie, but he is still a predator. Either way, the Parker nonsense is done. Fitting, then, that Buffy's metaphorical spirit is the one to best Parker first. I love that moment so much that when I think about Willow's arc throughout the seasons, I remember that moment as part of it. There is a curious, consistent theme beginning to arise here in the first five episodes. In The Freshman, Buffy struggled mightily to regain her identity and sense of self. And in living conditions, Kathy stole something of her natural essence for a time. Here, the call to a higher self is taken away by the beer. More on that later on. I think one one thing that's important to bear in mind here when considering these after-school special topics is that there is profoundly greater nuance to actual life. Casual sex can be fun and a comfort. Good drink can make for some entertaining evenings at times. Nothing is one thing to all people. The trick, I think, is honesty and self-awareness. Getting back to Freud, the point is not to vilify the id nor to deify the superego. They are all parts of a complete person, and there can be as much beauty and meaning to a great meal or a night of lovemaking as there is to a poem or a beautiful piece of architecture. Art comes in all forms. 